So that's a quote by George Box that's been around for a long time, and I, I always use it when I'm teaching predictive analytics, and students always ask me, you know, I can build a model, how good does it have to be? And that's a really hard question to answer. Um, it's a really hard question to answer because it depends, and I drive students to mend it um, by saying that whenever they ask the question, I say, oh, it depends. And the reason it depends is exactly that, that all models are approximations, so any predictive model that we build is an approximation to some real process or other, um, but some of those approximations are useful for us. And what I want to do is go through basically a, a series of lessons, and I'm going to go through six lessons uh, to make sure that we all get home at a, a reasonable hour, um, that I guess I've picked up from building predictive models over the years, and hopefully they might be useful to people. So these are the six lessons, and I'll basically just jump straight into them. And the first one is around what we mean by prediction. And when we build predictive models, what exactly are we talking about? And uh, I guess Connor was talking about it there, where he's talking about decision making. Um, and all of predictive modeling, in my mind at least, should, be, should start from the point of wanting to make better decisions. And this is a kind of process diagram that we use all the time. And basically over here, someone is going to make a decision. We're going to try and extract some insight from some data to help that do, do that in a better way. And in particular, if we're thinking about predictive models, the insight is going to be the output from a predictive model. We're going to use some predictive model to make an output here. But I think a, a useful thing to think about is what can that prediction be? Right? So what's the range of things that we can talk about? And I've used this. I don't know if people have come across this before. So it's Kaggle.com. So anyone who's, who's into predictive modeling will probably have used Kaggle.com. Kaggle.com is kind of a marketplace for crowdsourced predictive modeling. So if you have a, a predictive modeling project, and rather than hiring someone, you can put that project up on Kaggle.com with a cash prize, and then data scientists all around the world will try and build their best predictive model. And there's a leaderboard, and whoever wins at the end uh, or has the best model wins the prize. And you can see some of them are, some of them are worth a go. So there's prizes of $100,000 up there, and they kind of go all the way down to, to competitions that you just do for fun or for smaller money. But what they're useful for is to see the range of things that we can look at when we think about predictive modeling. And I just want to go through a few here. So the first one is this idea, the bike sharing demand forecast. So this is a Canadian city who has a scheme just like Dublin Bikes here. And what they would like is a nice predictive model that allows them to know next week on Tuesday, how many bikes am I going to need? Right, so what's the demand on that going to be? So essentially, we're predicting an unknown value um, into some time in the future. And that's very comfortably a forecast. Right? So we have some kind of time series, and we're going to forecast off into the future. And one of the things that I see a lot when I talk about predictive modeling to people is that's what people think about. So they have a notion of someone doing something at a point in time in the future. And that applies to some of the predictive modeling tasks we do, like the second one here, which is a marketing response um, challenge, where essentially you're trying to predict the propensity of somebody to respond to a particular offer. Um, and again, you're going to predict the likelihood of someone to do something into the future. And that very comfortably sits in as a, a ranking problem, essentially. So you're going to take all of your customers, and you want to put them in a ranking from most likely to respond to least likely to respond to this uh, marketing ad that you're going to put out to them. And that'll tell you about who's going to do something in the future. And you can make your decision about who you should send this ad to and who you should ignore, essentially. So both of those sit very comfortably in the idea of making a prediction into the future. But I think the definition of prediction we should think about is much broader than that. So if we look at these two challenges on Kaggle, there's the ultrasound nerve segmentation challenge, which is an image processing challenge, where basically there's um, scan or ultrasounds. And the job is to recognize whether those ultrasound images contain nerves or not. Um, the other one down here is a job salary prediction. Problem. So here, given a text description of a job, can you stamp that with an expected salary? So can you essentially label that with an expected salary? And we can think about these as labels or classification type tasks. And I think that's a key thing to keep in mind. So when we think about predictive modeling, um, that we, we don't always think about it having to have a temporal effect. It doesn't always have to be a prediction into the future. If I skip ahead of that, the definition that I think is useful, so in data analytics, a prediction is an assignment of a value to an unknown variable. And I think keeping that broad definition of predictive modeling is useful. And probably, if you think back over all the talks that we've seen in the last couple of days, um, hopefully most of them will kind of sit in there. And I think it's more useful than always thinking about a temporal effect behind that. So I think that's the key thing to think about first. So remembering that prediction and predictive modeling allows us to do a lot of different things but always to focus back on the decision and say, what's a, what kind of prediction is going to help me most in making a better decision and a better data-driven decision that might turn into a data-driven discussion at some point on the back of that. 
The second thing is, I, I really like this, there's this thing called the no free lunch theorem. Um, and this is a screenshot from uh, Rapid Miner. So Rapid Miner is a nice predictive modeling tool that people might have used. And one of the things in Rapid Miner, if you look, is in this screen over on the left, you open up a little tree, and it shows you all of the predictive modeling approaches that Rapid Miner, use, Rapid Miner gives you, Rapid Miner makes available. And you might think, I said, well, we can do rankings, we can do labelings, and we can do forecasts, so there should probably maybe be three right, approaches. That would make sense. But if you look at the list, there's 118 different predictive modeling algorithms that Rapid Miner supports. And if you look at other software, they'll have, reasonable, they'll have similar numbers. Some will have a few more, some will have a few less. And again, one of the things that I think people always think about when they start doing predictive modeling is, well, why are there so many? Why isn't there just one? Or why aren't there three? Maybe there's three different things we're going to do. There should be a much smaller number than this. And the reason there's so many is this idea the no free lunch theorem. So there's a really nice paper from 1997 that calls out this idea of the no free lunch theorem. And the key thing behind it is, if you have an algorithm that does really well on one particular prediction problem, it has to pay a price for that. And the price it's going to pay for its really good performance on one problem is it has to do badly on another. And you see this again and again and again um, whenever we do evaluations of uh, predictive models. And I just want to show you a really simple illustration of why that might be. So here we have a very simple toy predictive modeling problem. It's very much in that labeling camp. And I can imagine I have just two variables, F1 and F2, that I use to describe things. And things can be either good or bad. And this is the true underlying model, right? So this is the truth. So I mentioned that all models are wrong. Models can't access the truth. So we have, because this is a nice artificial example, we can access the truth. So let's imagine that's the truth of the thing that we're trying to model. And then what we do as predictive modelers is we take a data set. So these dots on this screen are to represent our data set, where we have crosses are the good things, the triangles are the bad things, and then I apply my predictive modeling algorithm to try and learn to tell the difference so I can add my labels or my stamps and say, well, these things should be good, these things should be bad. And going back to our, our screenshot from Rapid Miner, there's lots of different algorithms I could use. A simple one that people use a lot is a, a decision tree model. And if I use the decision tree model for this problem, the thick black line that I get down the middle is the model that it's going to learn. Right? That's what it's going to learn to do this problem. And if we think about the gray faded line in the background, you can see it does OK, but it's not perfect. Right? So it's going to make a good few mistakes. It's going to, where those little stairs creep in, it's going to say some good things are bad and some bad things are good. Another kind of model we can use is the nearest neighbor model. And this sort of wavy line is characteristics of the kind of model that a nearest neighbor algorithm um, is going to learn for me. And this probably does a slightly better job. But a third one we can use as a, a simple linear model. So again, people who do this, so a simple logistic regression model. And in this case, it does a perfect job. Right? So it turns out that the logistic regression model or linear model and the algorithm that builds that is perfectly suited to this data set. But here's a different data set. And there'll be no surprise, probably, what the conclusion is going to be in this case. So exactly the same idea. But if I look at my models, well, my decision tree does a really good job here. My nearest neighbor, my similarity model is, is kind of all over the place. And my linear model does a poor job in this case. And what I, I suppose I'm trying to do with this is illustrate exactly what's going on with this thing, the, the no free lunch theorem. So we have, in this case, two simple artificial data sets. They have different characteristics. And some machine learning algorithms or some model algorithms are better at learning those boundaries than others. The challenge is. In this nice, simple example, we have two variables. When we build real predictive models, we have 50 or 100 or 10,000 uh, variables. So you can't draw a nice picture, so you can never know. So you never know kind of ahead of time what the right modeling algorithm is going to be. People have their favorites. Um, people have their intuitions. People have their, their experience that tells them, well, for this kind of problem, this usually works. But it's very difficult to tell. And that's why there's so many different machine learning or predictive modeling algorithms out there. And the only thing you can really do is you've got to try them. So you've got to perform experiments to figure out which one is going to be best. The next lesson that I think is really important is, in doing that, it's really important to look for what we talk about as the Goldilocks models. So here's another really simple example where we have people's age and their income, and we have five data points here. And what I'd like to do is learn a model that's going to allow me to predict somebody's likely income based on their age. And I might learn a model that looks like this. So this straight line gives me, basically, for anybody's age, so I can say, here's somebody who's 40. Have a look up where that would meet the line. Go across, and somebody who's 40 should get paid about 40,000 euro, whereas somebody who's 80 should be paid about 60,000 euro. 
And most of us would say, that's not really doing a good job here. Right? That's not really capturing what's going on. I could build this model. This is a much more complex model, but we could do it, and we can make a, use an algorithm to learn this. The nice thing that this does is this perfectly matches the data that I've got, but it wobbles all over the place. It's got these weird loops and weird dips and uh, troughs in it. So that's not going to do a very good job for me. Whereas this model, which doesn't perfectly match the data points that I've got, but maybe you could argue suits the overall trend in terms of what I'm looking at. And in uh, predictive modeling, once we're training up a predictive model, we're constantly fighting this battle between the first model with the straight line, which would be a very underfit model, the wobbly line, which would be very much an overfit model. For, and what we're trying to do is battle against those two extremes and find what we call here the, the Goldilocks model in the middle, right? someone that's doing the perfect job for us. And I'll just show you a very simple example of this is a, a kind of a chart that you should always be looking out for if you're talking to somebody who's building predictive models for you and you want to think about whether they're doing this job properly. We use data sets to do that. So all of the predictive models that we're going to build are based on data sets, obviously, that tell us that the real answers. And we're going to try and infer these models from them. And most of these algorithms go through some kind of an iterative process where the model becomes more and more complex as time goes by. And that's what this chart is showing. And we can see these two lines go down and down and down until a point occurs around here where one of these lines curves up. And basically what's happening here is we're using one data set to train the model, a different data set to assess how close the model is to this Goldilocks model that I'm looking for that's not used in training. And what we should always be looking for is this point. And this point, in this case, represents that model. And we're going to roll back, basically, our complexity in the model to that point. So watching out for people building predictive models, you should always ask them about their validation set and ask them about whether they've looked for that Goldilocks model. Related to that, so we can think about different algorithms. We can think about sort of tuning those um, algorithms that we look at and, and looking at the models to get those Goldilocks models. The other key thing that we should always think about is data, and in particular, that better data almost always beats bigger, more complicated models. And I've got a little example in this that's nothing to do with predictive modeling, but to do with image processing instead. But I think it's a nice, idea, a nice way to illustrate um, how this idea works. So this is a picture of, if you kind of cross your eyes a little bit, it's a, man, it's a man on the moon. So there's a person here, and there's a big rock. But it's suffered from interference. right? So some real interference has messed up this picture. So what we might want to do from an image processing point of view is fix this picture. Right? So I'd like to clean this up and make it so it's a much nicer picture. And if I were to start to do that, well, I take the raw representation that I have here, which is a set of raw pixels. Right? So if you zoom right in on this image, this image is quite low resolution. So it's got a, a couple, maybe 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels. So there's like little squares of, of different grayscales in here. And I could use image processing techniques that work on that pixel representation. And if I did that, I might get the picture to here. And it's better, but it's not very good. Right? It's a little bit better, but it's still kind of blurry. It's still kind of weird. Um, but using that pixel representation of the data, it's very hard to pull out the noise and the messiness in this image. There's a different thing I could do, though, is I could change my representation. So instead of using the pixel representation of the image, I could use what's called a frequency um, domain representation of the image. So this is a picture that has all the information in the original image that we were looking at. So it doesn't look anything like a man on the moon, but all the information, all the data is in here. And the key thing that this shows us is if you look at that ring around the middle, so these dots that we see here, because the particular interference in this image is um, periodic interference, so essentially this camera was beside a generator or something like that. It's a bit of electrical interference. But it's nice and regular and periodic. It jumps out in this representation. So basically, those dots are the noise. And if I work in this representation, I can apply what's called a bandpass filter, and my image jumps out like this. Right? So it's really nice, it's really sharp, it's really clear, all the noise has gone away. And I think that's a nice illustration of changing your data is often the best thing that you can do in order to solve a particular problem. And I think the same thing applies to predictive modeling. So we often start with a particular representation of our data. Changing that representation is a great way to, to get better models. And in particular, changing that representation will often allow you to use much simpler modeling algorithms than sticking with an original representation and having to use very complicated modeling algorithms. I'll skip past that. Um, 
And those kind of last three lessons kind of sit together here. I think this is what we do a lot of the time when we build predictive models. So there's really only three things we can do to make our models better. So if you have a particular predictive modeling problem, there's only really three things that you're able to do. So you can get better data, you can choose a better algorithm, or you can tune the parameters of your algorithm. And we spend our time basically hopping between these three different boxes. Um, and I guess the, the point I'm trying to make here is time spent up there with data is probably time well spent rather than spending time choosing more complicated algorithms and tuning those algorithms to death. Cool. Second last one is around that idea. So all the time here, what we're looking at is different models that we might use or different algorithms that we might use. Evaluation becomes key then. Right? So how are we going to say this approach is better than that approach? So that tuning parameter is better. That way to represent the data is better. And the way that we do that is we run experiments. So like I said, we have this no free lunch problem that we have to do experiments all the time, and we have to basically test out the different options that we might try. And if we're going to run experiments and test things out, well, then we need evaluation metrics to say, you know, this model is better than this model, so this is the one that we should use. And we can illustrate the importance of choosing the right evaluation metric with a simple example here. So if you imagine a marketing company, and they're working for a charity, and they want to decide who to send uh, a request for a donation out to or not. So a real classic predictive modeling problem. Well, we might build two models, and I might show you model one. And for people who do this, I'll show a confusion matrix. And you can look at your confusion matrix and think about what might be going on. But the key thing is this number down here. So I might evaluate how good this model is based on classification accuracy. And that gives me a number of 85.9. So that's a key number to keep in mind. Then I might have a second model. And it might manage a score of 79.6. If you think about classification accuracy, so higher is obviously better. So if I had to choose between the two of these, I'm going to choose model one. Right? So model one is more accurately recognizing people who are likely to give me a donation versus people who aren't. One key thing here is, though, that this is one of these ranking problems. So in doing this, basically, I probably have a big list of all the people I could ask. And what I want to do is figure out which are the ones that I should. This shows cumulative gain. And the key thing with cumulative gain is it tells me how many of the people that will respond I'll get if I go after the top of that ranking. This is the cumulative gain chart for the first model. This is the cumulative gain chart for the second model. And without spending a lot of time talking about how cumulative gain works, the key thing is you want higher curves. Right? Higher curves mean that if you take just the 10 or top 10 or 20%, you'll get more people who will actually respond. And in this case, model two is actually much better than model one. And I think it's a nice example of always thinking hard about what's the problem that you're trying to solve and making sure that your evaluation metric matches whatever that problem is that you're going to solve. And the last one I just want to show you is this idea of remembering Occam's razor. And I'll just show you an example that I was trying to do recently. So we were looking at Twitter data, and we were trying to build up profiles of people based on Twitter data. And one of the things that we wanted to learn was people's gender, so whether they're male or female. And we spent a long time looking at all the data that we can get from Twitter, so tweets and follower lists and all this kind of stuff. And we built predictive models, and we tried to do it, and we were getting nowhere. Right? So it was very bad, until someone came along and said, well, if you look up there, you get people's names. And if you take people's first names, and go to the CSO, and every country in the world pretty much has this, you can get a nice data set that tells you the likelihood of a first name to belong to a male or a female. Um, and if you build your gender detector model based on first names, it works beautifully. Right? And it works better than any complicated model that you might build using all kinds of interesting machine learning and all kinds of interesting features about behavior and content. Um, and it's just a quick reminder of this old rule, Occam's razor, that try simple things first and only add complexity if simple things don't work. And I think there's a really important thing in predictive modeling, because people like me get very excited about complicated things and want to jump in there straight away. Um, and other people shouldn't let us do that. So that's the end of the, the six lessons that I want to take you through. So thanks very much. And I hope they'll be useful if people are building predictive models in the future. Well, Brian, thanks.